Hey everybody and welcome to another Star Citizen video. My name is Scary Spikes and in today's video we'll be continuing with episode 3 of my episodic comprehensive beginner's guide for new and returning players to the verse. If you haven't seen the last two videos, episode 2 and episode 1, they're a little dry but provide a lot of information that we'll be building on today so make sure to go ahead and check them out. I'll have them linked in the cards up in the top right hand corner of the screen and in the description for your convenience. Do also consider using my code as a new player down below to sign up for your Star Citizen account to get 5,000 extra Alpha UEC free of charge. A huge thank you to Goha before we get started with this video for continuing to support the channel as a VIP Gold contributor. And you too can support the channel in meaningful ways, including liking the video and becoming a subscriber if you found my videos helpful to you, as well as ringing the bell never to miss one in the future. Of course, there are many other ways, including becoming a subscriber on Twitch and a channel member here on YouTube, and now there is yet one more. Because of some popular demand and having a few of our community members ask me to do this, I finally decided to pull the trigger, and now we are also on Patreon. I'm so excited to finally announce this. There's so many cool different tiers available for everybody's budget. There's a few little Easter eggs and some hidden gems in there, as well as an exclusive offer on one of the tiers, which allows you to download all of my videos ad-free and watch them at your convenience in high resolution at any time. If you'd like to help support me directly, it's really a driving factor in helping to continue to increase my production quality, paying for things like gear and rent, and also just helping to support me and my family. So if you find a lot of value in this channel and you'd like to help, please consider becoming a patron. There's going to be a link in the top right hand corner of the screen, as well as in the description and the end cards of each of my videos. Thank you again so much for your support, and let's get started with this video. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started and pull out one of our ships, and in order to do so, you'll need to access one of these ASOP terminals. These can be found at any of the orbital stations, as you can see, we're currently here on Everest Harbor, just above Lorville, above the planet of Hurston, but you're able to access these at any of the other major stations as well as any of the other landing zones available in the game at the moment. So simply walk up to them, and if you remember from the previous video, you can go ahead and hold F, and that's going to allow you to interact by using the left mouse button. And this is your fleet manager window. So you're going to be able to scroll down and up to manage your fleet here. And uh, you'll be able to see all of the ships that you have. And this is indicative of any ship that you may have purchased either in the game with Alpha UEC, which you might not be at that point yet. Uh, or also, and more specifically, any kind of ships or vehicles that you may have pledged for on the RSI website, which you may have done so if you were following from the very first video. So you'll see that we have a number of different ships available and there are some categories. I'm just going to very quickly explain this to you before we get going. Of course, you can use the chaptering and the timestamps in the description below to go ahead and jump to any part of the video that you find helpful. Right, so on the left-hand side, we're going to see that we have the name of the vessel. That'll show you, of course, uh, the, the full name of the ship that you're looking at. You're going to have some information here, so it's going to tell you whether the ship is stored or impounded or whether it's destroyed. It's going to also show you the location. The status is not too important. This may change down the road, but generally speaking, it doesn't change very often, so nothing to concern yourself with at the moment. The focus is going to tell you basically the focus of the ship in itself. So, for example, this one here, the MPUV personnel, is a passenger ship. Then we have uh, this one here, which is the Banner Defender, which is classified as a light fighter, and so on. So this will give you uh, sort of an indication as to what each of the ships does. And this can be really helpful for newer players to identify what they're best used for, especially during something like a free fly event that we had very recently. Now, you're going to see this thing up here as well that says cargo. This is going to show you how much cargo is currently on board but not necessarily how much cargo the ship is capable of carrying. Something to distinguish there and keep in mind. Now, you're also going to see a crew here. So this is going to show you the uh, the crew of the ship. Naturally, you can have less or more. In most cases, you want to, of course, have at least one to be able to actually fly the ship, but you can also have more. So if we scroll up, for example, we see that on this Redeemer, we have a crew of four. You don't actually even need a crew of four. You need a crew of three at the bare minimum, in my opinion but you can have a maximum uh, or an average of a crew of four to best use that particular ship. Now you're going to have uh, some different uh, buttons here on the right hand side. Uh, don't pay any mind to the track button that does not do anything at the moment, but you are going to see one of two buttons mainly and predominantly it's going to be the retrieve button, which is going to allow you to retrieve the ship from storage. And if you can see here, we can see that we have our Andromeda here, which was actually a rental and hasn't gone away yet. Uh, that is uh, at Lorville, and we can go ahead and retrieve that ship, and it'll bring it to one of the pads here on Everest Harbor. Because if you remember, in one of my previous videos in the guide here, I said that 
you know, the major uh, landing areas here, they do share an inventory with all of their respective orbital stations. So, for example, Lorville shares an inventory with Everest Harbor, and uh, New Babbage shares an inventory with Port Tresler, Area 18 with Pagini Point, and Orson with Port Olisar. So, something to keep in mind is that if you have a ship on the main landing zone and you find your way up to the orbital station or vice versa, you can always pull out ships as well as any kind of armor, weapons, undersuits, and supplies, and so on. As long as they are in one of those two locations, you'll be absolutely fine. Now, you might notice that we also have a claim button here. If we go ahead and click on this, it's going to show us a different screen. And this is basically the vehicle insurance screen. So all vehicles in the game at the moment, at least, have lifetime insurance. And I know that might be a little uh, confusing because there are different ways, different types of insurance that are sold with different types of vehicles on the RSI website when you're making a pledge. So you might notice uh, that some vehicles come with six months insurance, some come with 12, some come with 24, some come with 120, and some others, very, very few of them these days, come with lifetime or LTI. What that means is that once the game launches, that is when those insurance contracts kick in, and that is how long you never have to worry about ever losing your ship, because all you need to do is go ahead and click on the claim button, and it's going to make an insurance claim on your ship, returning it back to you uh, sans cargo, of course. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And uh, it's going to have all of the different components that it had on it previously before it was destroyed or you know, something bad happened to it or before you forgot that you left it on the other side of the system and you simply want to claim it because you don't want to fly all the way there. So this is actually a pretty good example of that. Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to fly back to HDMS Anderson because I've left the ship there in a different session. I very much doubt that it would continue to stay there because we don't have that level of persistence just yet in the game. We can see that we have the name of the vehicle, where it was last left, and how long it's going to take to deliver it once we file a claim. If we click on the button to file a claim, we're going to see a few things. First of all, the timer is going to start climbing uh, down all the way until zero, at which point we'll be able to retrieve the ship at this terminal at this station. And then we also have the expedited time. This is how much time is going to be have to elapse before we can do the same if we decide to pay the expedited fee, which you can see is here. Now, as the time reduces, the fee also reduces. So if it's a matter of emergency, and you absolutely need to pull your ship out sooner than later, then you can certainly pay the fee. Uh, it's not really a huge amount. I really wish the ASOP terminal wouldn't do that, by the way. Um, but you see that if we actually go back, you can see that we do have an option to expedite. So if you have an expedite button, it does uh, mean that your ship is going to be delivered very soon. Now, this is one of those rare instances where you can actually see under the status, it's going to tell you how much time is left. If you do want to expedite, all you need to do is click on that button. It'll take you back into the insurance screen. Simply go ahead and click on pay the fee. And then you'll notice that now we have the same information here, but our timer has reduced dramatically. And we're going to be able to go ahead and take that ship out in less than three and a half minutes, which can be very good. If you're doing a mission where it's critical to bring out a ship as quickly as possible, maybe one that's been destroyed or maybe an extra ship. Uh, so it's, it's always something that is good to keep in mind and will help you to manage your fleet going forward in the future. So again, a quick note on the insurance is that, you know, everybody at the moment has lifetime insurance. So even if you have a ship that has six month insurance, you never have to worry about losing that ship for as long as it's a pledge ship, first of all, because if we go through a massive wipe, for example, like we had in 3.15, where everything in the long term persistence ledger is wiped out, that will include any ships that you may have purchased in the game. So that doesn't count. But anything that you actually pledge online, you should never lose access to for the duration of the alpha with the exception that some wipes might remove some components and other things like that from it. But you'll never lose access to that ship and you can use the insurance as much as you like. Obviously, it's going to take a little bit more than six months for the game to actually finally come out. So you don't have to worry about it at that point. Of course, uh, lifetime insurance is a very, very attractive offer for once the game actually comes out. But you do need to take advantage of it before that happens in order to carry it over into the retail release of the game. So I have another video that I can link for you in the top right hand corner of the screen, which will explain a little bit more about LTI. Uh, but in the meantime, we're just going to go ahead and move on and take out one of our ships and go and do some combat and some basic navigation. Excuse you, good sir. I'll see you on the other side. All right, so let's go ahead and take out the uh, Redeemer here. We're going to go ahead and click on Retrieve. And when you do that, you're going to be met with a little bit of a wait. And then the ASAP Terminal is going to tell you which pad or hangar you're going to go to. So in this case, it's going to be pad number six. Always press F4 and just double check that you're wearing a helmet because running outside into space with no helmet is only going to end with Bad News Bears. So you want to make sure that you have a helmet on board. 
Now uh, we're going to go ahead and head over to pad 6. Okay, so as in the previous video, we're going to press R uh, to make the ship flight ready. And you can use the F5, F6, F7, and F8 keys to manage your power triangle, which you can see under the power tab. Now, we don't have the power tab open, so I'm going to go ahead and switch over that uh, to that in the MFD here. We're doing this again, holding the F key and zooming in and out with the mouse wheel. We're going to go ahead and left click on where it says menu, and we're going to go ahead and click on power. All right, so this is your power triangle, and it's very similar to that of the Elite Dangerous power triangle uh, and your power distributor in that game if you've uh, played that game or you're coming from that game. So you'll notice on the left-hand side of the top left-hand corner, we have one for weapons. In the top right, we have the shields, and in the bottom center, we have the thrusters. Now, you can move this around by simply left-clicking and holding, but generally speaking, the best way is you can simply use your F5, 6, 7, and 8 keys to change things around. Of course, you can bind the Seer Hotas as well if you have that. F8 is going to be your reset button, so it'll always center everything. F5 will start to skew your power to your weapons, F6 to your thrusters, and F7 to your shields. Generally speaking, I like to have the weapons and the shields at 50 each, and very little too, if any, on the thrusters, because generally I don't really use a lot of boost, especially with larger ships with many turrets on it like the Redeemer. Plus, we have two size three shields, which are definitely going to be able to hold up to some of the firepower that we're going to be facing today. So I'm not really too worried about having to run away just in case things go south. Now, everything else seems to be pretty normal. I typically like to have my target screen on the top. So we're going to go ahead and change that too. And this is what I really like about being able to uh, modulate or uh, mod modularize, if that's even a word. It is now your MFDs, which is really cool because we get to change the way that we have things displayed so we're going to go ahead and put the target up there which of course is going to display our active target once we have one and then down here i'm going to go ahead and put on the self status and then over here we don't really need the comms panel all that much because we don't really need to call the station to get away from it we just need it to land and we can always do that through the f11 menu so i'd prefer to have this mfd on something else and usually for that i prefer to have my shields here so that's it. Pretty simple. We've got our shields. We've got our power on the left hand side, our target and our self status on the right hand side. And of course, our radar in the middle. OK, so the next thing I want to talk about are fire groups and fire groups are pretty interesting. You can go ahead and change them very easily using the MFDs in your ship. So you can go ahead and click on the menu there. And then, of course, you want to go down to where it says weapons and click on that. Go over to your guns, and then you can change your fire groups from a 0 to a 1. Unfortunately, at the moment, we only have two fire groups. If you have one set up, you can't set up an additional one, unfortunately, like you can in Elite Dangerous. Um, but I'm sure that eventually this will be fixed. So what you can do with this is you can set a set of weapons to fire on a particular mouse button. 0 is left mouse button, and 1 is right mouse button. So if we leave these all at zero, you can see that if we press the left mouse button, it's going to fire all of our weapons at the same time, indicated by this menu on the left hand side of the UI panel. And then if we change, for example, our CF447 Rhino laser repeaters to a one, that's going to mean that our 337s are going to be on the first mouse button and our 447s will now be on the second mouse button. And again, as indicated by the UI. I personally like to have them all on exactly the same button unless I have very different types of weapons for different types of applications or I'm flying a ship with an EMP in it that forces me to have one button for the EMP and the rest for my weapons because unfortunately we only have two fire groups. So we're currently hanging out in Ariel's atmosphere on the Redeemer and I want to take a moment to talk about the different fire modes available to you on pretty much any ship in the game. In order to understand how they work though, you need to understand the differences between fixed and gimbaled weapons. Each has advantages and disadvantages, and I'll explain a little bit here, but I'll also include a video in the top right-hand corner of the screen that gives you quite a lot more depth and information about it. So what's the big difference? Well, fixed mode, as you can see here, includes a weapon of a particular size being mounted to a mount, which is basically right on the chassis or hull of the ship, which is also exactly the same size. So in this case, we have a size 4 weapon mounted to a size 4 hardpoint on a ship. Now, the advantage to this is that you're using the largest weapon that you possibly can for the ship, and that means that you're doing about as much DPS as your piloting skill can allow. Of course, the downside of that is that your piloting skill does come into effect as you need to aim these weapons by maneuvering your ship. Now, of course, you can also use gimbals, which are much easier, especially for new players, but they have their downsides too. Namely, if you're putting a gimbal on a hardpoint, the gimbal is going to be the same size as the hardpoint, but the weapon that it will accept will always be one size smaller than it. So 
For example, if we have a size 4 hard point as we do on this ship here, we'll be able to put a size 4 gimbal on it, but it will only be able to take a size 3 weapon. Which means that yes, although you are getting some help aiming and you're probably getting more shots on target in most cases, we'll talk about that later, you're really kind of hurting yourself in the sense that you're not always going to be able to hit the target because of lag and desync and also you're using a weapon that is smaller than what your ship is capable of holding and so thus you're kind of gimping yourself with the overall dps that you can do assuming you can get 100 of your shots on target using both fixed or gimbaled weapons alike so now that you know the difference between fixed and gimbaled weapons mounting, we're going to be talking about the different firing modes on your ship that allow you to take advantage of that. So first of all, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the first mode. This is going to be your bore sight mode, and then you can switch modes with the G key over to the gimbaled mode, and then finally to the assist mode. We'll talk about each of these uh, for a few minutes. So the very first one and my favorite one is the fixed mode. Now note that this is going to fire all of your weapons, regardless of whether they are fixed, gimbaled, or turreted in a bore sight configuration, meaning they're gonna be fired straight ahead directly into the middle of this tiny little crosshair here. And uh, you're gonna be able to lock that up with the trailing or leading pips of a target in order to predict its trajectory to be able to hit it effectively. The great thing and the bonuses or sort of the pros about this is that it's not very susceptible to lag or desync, and it makes you a better pilot because you have to maneuver in order to be able to actually hit your target. The really nice thing about this too is it puts all of your weapons in boresight mode which means that the maximum amount of dps that you can possibly put down with your pilot weapons is going to be applied to your target so long as you can put your shots on target let's go ahead and have a look at the second mode quickly this is going to be your gimbaled mode and this is only useful if you have gimbaled weapons on your ship what this does is it gives your weapons a slight aim assist from the computer as long as you have your target locked within this little area within the circle here and as long as the target is within range of your weapons the computer will try to track them automatically and then all you need to do is press down your fire button to fire your weapons the pros to this is it makes it a little bit easier to uh, fire on targets in a fast moving environment. Also, if the targets happen to be a little smaller and more maneuverable than you are, it does make things a little easier in that regard as well. The downside, unfortunately, is that it is extremely susceptible to lag and desync, especially with more people in your party, which is something that I found to be a problem, especially recently, and also with just generally more people on the server and with a lot more traffic happening on the network. So this is really going to be a very unreliable way to try to more accurately hit targets, which I know sounds a little bit like an oxymoron, but that's because it is. And honestly, for those reasons, I really would not recommend using this or any gimbaled weapons at all. The final mode is going to be our fixed mode here, and this is really the most interesting of the two. It's a bit of a hybrid mode between the two because it does allow you to shoot some of your fixed or all of your fixed weapons perfectly straight. As you can see, we actually have a smaller crosshair and a larger crosshair. So in this uh, kind of a hybrid mode, what's happening is all of your fixed weapons are being fired directly in boresight mode as in the very first mode that we looked at straight ahead into this little crosshair here but in the larger crosshair what that's doing is it's slaving any weapons that you have on a turret that you have access to on a turret uh, or and or any kind of gimbaled weapons as well so if we take a look on the front of the ship here you can see that we have our weapons on the far side so on the port and the starboard side of the ship under the wings we have our size four fixed weapons and on the very front we have a remote turret with size 3 weapons which is actually slaved to the pilot and that's why we're able to fire it so long as nobody is sitting in the seat uh, that controls that turret inside of the actual ship now in this mode we're actually able to move the turret around while we're also moving the ship you can see the maneuvering thrusters are moving around as well and then we can basically fire on other smaller ships with the smaller turret as opposed to maneuvering the entire ship in order to be able to do so so the benefits to this could be that for smaller ships you could have a better chance of hitting them as they're making a strafing run on you but honestly the downside is it's just way too inaccurate to try to hit two different targets at the same time one with fixed weapons and one with an articulating weapon and for that reason i just don't think it's worth it especially not since in this kind of a ship anyway we have turrets uh, that are on the bottom and the top of the ship respectively and so you really don't have to use this mode because your gunners are going to be able to do it for you automatically all right, before we get into combat, let's just quickly talk about the missile operator mode. And if you want to see a full-fledged video on that, go ahead and check out the link in the top right-hand corner of the screen. I did a full video on this in 3.14.1, and it is still very, very much up to date. So it'll give you a lot more detail than we'll be covering here. This is going to be just the basics to get you started. So middle mouse button will get you between your guns. 
and missile operator mode and it's important to note that you can't do both at the same time the only exception to that is if you're in a multi-crew ship like the constellation andromeda for instance you can have your co-pilot manage missile operator mode for you and fire missiles and lock targets while you are handling the guns of the ship other than that you have to switch between the two but honestly it's not a big deal over on the right hand side let's take a look at some symbology really quickly we have the dominator missile here this will be the name of the missile that you currently have equipped and you can change it simply by pressing the right mouse button we only have dominators on board so we're not going to be able to show you that uh, but it'll be uh, very easy to see in this area here once you press the right mouse button if you've got different types of missiles available like for example on the harbinger the number here in roman numerals is going to denote the size of missile that you have available and so in this case we can see we have a size 2 missile we have a little green bar here the green bar shows you that the missile is ready to fire and it is good to go we have a number over here just to the left of this little icon the number shows us the amount of missiles that we have left uh, and this specific to the missile that we currently have selected and then so is the little icon here which will show you the type of missile that you currently have selected and the lightning bolt in this case shows us that it is an em or electromagnetic missile for some basic controls you can simply press the g key to queue up multiple missiles and just keep in mind that uh, none of the missiles that are currently queuing in a white bar as it's building up to green are actually going to fire only the solid green ones will fire and what's kind of cool is you can also dumb fire these without having a lock if you really want to not sure why you'd want to do this but you can and you can pretty much get into some crazy shenanigans with it if you're creative so that is the basics of the missile operator mode let's go ahead and get into the contracts manager and find us a fight all right, so let's head into the contracts manager. We'll go ahead and find ourselves a quick mission to do to demonstrate everything that we've learned so far. So we'll press F1 to get into the Moby Glass. And then down here, you'll see that we have a tab for contracts manager. So go ahead and click on that. And anytime that you're doing any kind of bounty hunting, you'll find any of your bounty hunting contracts right over here. But you'll also want to go into mercenary and pick up this mission called call to arms. Basically, what this does is it gives you extra money, which is especially good at the beginning for each kill that you get. And this doesn't matter whether it's a player or a NPC. As long as they have a crime stat on them, you'll get more money for the higher amount of crime stat that they have. So if they have a level five crime stat, you'll get a thousand UBC a pop. A level four will get you 700 UBC and so on. I'm not sure why level one through three is all the same. I think they should definitely change them, but I digress. Let's go ahead and accept this quickly. And then we'll go ahead and go back into the general tab under the contracts manager, go into the bounty hunting, and then we're going to go ahead and pick ourselves a bounty. And it looks like this light risk target will be a pretty good victim for showing off everything that we've learned today. So we'll go ahead and click on that and click on accept offer. And then we can simply get out of the Moby glass. Now you might notice that we have a mission marker, but in this case, it looks like we don't automatically have one. So if that happens to you, go back into the contracts manager, simply go to the accepted tab go to your contract and just make sure that it's tracked which uh, you'll know it's not if if it says track here if you click on track it'll change to untrack and then that means that the mission is actually tracked and you'll be able to see this little icon here denoting that you are currently tracking that mission now if we get out of the contracts manager you should be able to see towards the top of the screen we have a little diamond and with an arrow showing us where the actual uh, mission is so now all we need to do is head over into our map by pressing f2 We'll go ahead and double click on Hurston to uh, zoom in on the Hurston subsystem and all of its moons. And then we're going to use our mouse wheel to zoom in on Eda, which we can see we have a uh, mission over there. So we'll double click on Eda to make things a little easier. We'll use the right mouse button to move things around. You can use the left mouse button to move things around this way. And then we'll simply uh, hover over this little uh, target location here and click on that. And then we'll click on set route. And then as you can see, on the left hand corner of the screen here at the top we'll see that we have our route set it'll show you how much quantum fuel you're going to use this is the total amount of fuel that's required and this is the total amount of fuel that you have on board if you run out of this you will be stuck in space so keep an eye out on that all right so it's time to get going we're going to go ahead and line up with the first waypoint and we'll press b as in bravo to engage the quantum drive and you'll want to make sure that you are using this crosshair to aim as opposed to this it's really, really confusing, especially for new players. So always make sure that you're aiming at the waypoint with the crosshair and not with this thing. Now, the quantum drive is going to go ahead and spool and calibrate. As long as both of those are complete and ready, you are good to go. And you can hold B to get yourself into quantum drive. 
All right, so we're just outside the target area here. The target's about 14 kilometers to our 12 o'clock here. And uh, before I go in, I usually like to get a few things set up just for myself. So first and foremost, I want to make sure that my power distributor is where I like it to be. And that, in most cases, is going to be 50% to power and 50% to weapons with 0% to thrusters. I don't typically boost a whole lot, and this thing is really good at boosting efficiency anyway. So I'm not really going to need this until I need it. So I'm just going to keep the power distributor this way for now. Now, the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that I am in my missile operator mode since I like to sling some missiles before I engage with guns since typically the missiles have a longer range. So we can use those to kind of beat down the shields of our opponents a little bit before we engage and finish them off with guns. Lastly, we're going to take a look at our uh, available decoys and noise. These are going to be our countermeasures. And what's pretty cool is that you can uh, use H and J to deploy them. But if you hold H, you can actually queue a number of decoys at, at a certain time. So we've got four queued there, and as soon as we let go of H, that's going to let those decoys go, and they are going to try to fool any missiles that are coming towards us. The noise is pretty good in trying to prevent the enemy from targeting us to begin with, and honestly, these things should just be called chaff and flare. I have no idea why they have called them noise and decoy. It just doesn't make any sense, but hey, that's what it is, and that's what they're used for. Again, uh, decoy is your H key, and noise is your J key by default. One thing that you can do here too is if it's particularly dark you can use the tab button to do a pulse scan and that's going to highlight any kind of rocks that are in the vicinity which will make it a lot easier for you not to broadside one of these things with your ship and end up calling it a day before the fight is through. So one of the other things to keep in mind as well is that it's usually going to take about uh, 10 kilometers or, or so out from your target before you start to notice them unless they're really big. So if they're in like a Corvette uh, or for example a frigate then you'll be able to see them quite a bit further out since their uh, signature is going to be quite large but for any small ships especially ones that are uh, small fighters or even medium-sized fighters you typically won't see them until about eight to ten kilometers out so it's pretty normal to not be able to really see anything and only to hear a radar lock from the enemy but not be able to see them until we get pretty close so we'll continue to move closer and as you can see there we have uh, what looks like a target you never want to shoot them while they are white you want to wait for their uh their pip to go red we're going to go ahead and just uh, wait for all of the green pips to surround the target and the more green pips that we have the better chance we have of our missiles hitting now we can also fire another pair of missiles here it looks like they did use a little bit of countermeasures but it looks like the missiles were enough to take them out and that is it that is the mission it's pretty straightforward now sometimes they will have some friends with them of course i took them out ahead of time so we were only fighting one target but that's pretty straightforward now of course uh, you can also shoot with your guns if you get close to them there will be a pip that will appear on the screen and uh, you'll be able to just follow the pip and get some shots on target that'll take care of them as well but if you have missiles missiles are a very good way of taking targets out well before they get to you and it could be a good way to thin out their forces if they have a few friends with them so that you can focus on the most dangerous ones with your guns thank you so very much for watching i hope you enjoyed this video and found it helpful and are enjoying the series as a whole I know it's a little dry sometimes, but it really helps out new players and I've been getting a lot of positive feedback on the video so far. If you really enjoyed it and found it helpful and want to help me out, you can do so by leaving a like and sharing this video with your communities, as well as becoming a subscriber and turning on notifications so you don't miss any of them in the future. Of course, you can join me on stream Wednesdays and Fridays at 8pm Eastern over on Twitch and our amazing Discord community, links down below. And of course, if you'd like to go above and beyond, you can become a patron now, which is awesome. We have all sorts of different tiers and some goodies available for everybody. Make sure to swing by our Patreon page and consider becoming a patron. Your direct support really makes a big difference in making this channel better and helping me to better myself. So thank you for your support and I hope to see you in the next video. A huge thank you before we get... Oh, fuck off. Are you kidding me? Yeah.